In this video, we're going to be talking about the tribunes of the plebs. This was a magistracy like no other. Their primary purpose was to protect the persons and property of the plebeians at Rome. They had power enough by the time of the late Republic to shape the very political climate at Rome. To understand the tribune of the late Republic, we must begin with its origins in the 5th century BC. In 494 BC, using the Veronian dating, the non-patrician population of Rome seceded to either the Aventine Hill or the Mons Sacca, both of which were outside of the Pomerium, the city limits. Once there, they refused to partake in military service as a result of the failure of the patricians, the leading men at Rome, to alleviate the burdens of debt that non-patricians were incurring, or so Livy's narrative goes, while they were away fighting. This leaving of the city is called the first secession of the plebs. There were possibly more, but this is the one at which the tribunes of the plebs were created. To protect the non-patricians, now plebeians, representatives were nominated at the secession of the plebs. These were to be known as tribunes of the plebs. At first there were two, then five, and then by 457 BC there were ten. This number remained the same until the late Republic. So what kinds of powers did these representatives have? Well, let's take a look at Tribunicia Potestas in the late Roman Republic. Tribunes of the plebs were elected in July, and from this point onwards they became tribunes designate and could begin or continue to draft proposals for legislation until they entered into office on the 10th of December. By this time, Tribunicia Potestas allowed them a wide range of capabilities. As I mentioned earlier, their primary purpose was to protect the persons and property of the plebeians at Rome. In order to do this, they were invested with the Ius Auxiliae, or the right to help. In order to be able to help the plebeians at Rome, tribunes were required to remain reachable at all times, and so they could not leave the city of Rome itself. In addition to the Ius Auxiliae, tribunes of the plebs also possessed sacrosanctitas. Their persons were inviolable and they could not be harmed. To harm a tribune was punishable by death. At least in the early Republic, we can assume that this death penalty was carried out by the plebeians that they mutually protected. Tribunes, like consuls and other magistrates, possessed the right of intercessio. This enabled them to interject against the actions of any other magistrate, senior or junior. This was the power to veto, literally, I forbid it. This was also enjoyed by the consuls, who could veto one another and junior magistrates. In addition to protecting the persons and property of the plebeians at Rome, the tribunes also had to communicate to the patricians the wants and needs of those that they were protecting. In order to do this, tribunes of the plebs had the right to convoke consiones and the concilium plebis in order to enter into discourses with the plebeians. To convoke the plebeian assembly and to conduct business with it, tribunes of the plebs possessed the ius agendi, which was also enjoyed by the consuls and praetors. As magistrates, they also had the right to call contiones, which were meetings open to the populace that served as occasions for the promulgation of legislation or the advocating or rejecting of certain proposals. The most important aspect of the Tribunicia Potestas was finalised in 287 BC, when the tribunes of the plebs gained the right to propose and enact, via the Concilium Plebis, legislation that was binding on the populace as a whole. But what was the purpose of the tribunes of the plebs in the late Republic? And what kinds of things can we see them doing? By the beginning of the late Republic, we can see tribunes of the plebs more frequently proposing popular legislation that would benefit the populace as a whole. Legislation such as land distribution and population redistribution were passed frequently. In 88 BC, the tribune of the plebs, Publius Sulpicius Rufus, in an effort to push through some of these popular measures, sided with the consul Gaius Marius to overturn the assignment of an important command against Mithridates in the east. In retaliation, Sulla marched on Rome and killed the tribune, violating his sacrosanctitas. Years later, in 81 BC, following the civil war fought between Marius and Sulla, in an attempt to strengthen the position of the Senate and senior magistrates, Sulla enacted legislation that diminished the Tribunicia Potestas. Following Sulla's reforms to the tribunate, tribunes could no longer advance up the cursus honorum, nor could they pass legislation in their concilium plebis. This effectively killed off the tribunate. 
Although five years later, the Lex Aurelia restored the tribunes of the plebs right to hold further offices, it wasn't until 70 BC that Pompey and Crassus restored fully Tribunicia Potestas and the right of the tribunes to propose legislation. After a 10 year lull in activity, the next 20 years from 69 to 49 saw a massive amount of tribunician activity taking place. The last decades of the Roman Republic saw tribunes of the plebs continue to engage in popular activity. This involved proposing legislation such as land distribution and legislation which sought to curb magisterial and electoral corruption. Tribunes of the plebs also passed legislation that reorganised electoral processes and subsidised food for the masses at Rome. They continued to be the principal legislators of the late Republic, convening and presiding over the plebeian assembly. Now that they could obtain higher offices following their tribunate, just like any other magistracy, competition once more increased. Because of this increased competition, it is rare that we see unanimity within the College of Ten Tribunes. For example, in 67 BC, the Tribune Trebellius was threatened with removal from office when he tried to speak over the Tribune Gabinius, who was proposing Pompey's extraordinary command. However, that is not to say that Tribunician colleges never worked together. For example, in 64 BC, the entire College of Tribunes designate were working together on a land bill led by the Tribune Rullus. Rullus was proposing the redistribution of some of Rome's most valuable Arga Publicus, the Companion Land. By the time they assumed office on December 10, 64, ready for 63 BC, the bill was well underway and was proposed soon after. The consul designate, Marcus Tullius Cicero, would not take office until January 1st and was shunned by the tribunes in his inquiries into their activities and offers of aid. As a result, Cicero vehemently opposed the bill. This episode shows the advantage that tribunes of the plebs had in their electoral dates over consuls who came in almost a month later. Unfortunately, towards the end of the Republic, Tribunicia Potestas was assumed by Gaius Julius Caesar and Octavian in 44 and 36 respectively. This meant the demise of the tribune of the plebs. The office was effectively nullified. So let's take a look now at some of the most important points to take away about the Tribune of the Plebs. Originally, the office was created to protect non-patricians against the burdens of debt and unfair treatment of the ruling patrician classes. Bestowed with the Tribunicia Potestas over time, this allowed them to pass legislation, protect members of the plebs, interject against the actions of senior magistrates and to remain unharmed while doing so. Tribunes of the Plebs did not always work together. They were subject to the same political competitiveness as the rest of the magistracies in the late Republic. But they could, especially later on under the domination of Caesar, Pompey and Crassus. They had the advantage over the consuls of assuming office around a month earlier and they passed laws in response to what the people wanted or needed. Although it's important to remember that they often also passed laws or vetoed laws according to the desires of the powerful men. The importance of the office of Tribune of the Plebs and of Tribunicia Potestas can be seen lasting to the imperial period. During the empire, emperors dated the years of their reign from the year in which they were granted Tribunicia Potestas.